All right, so you should see my MATLAB uh, screen here. So, um, and I'll um, I'll send you guys Nerex. I'll send you guys the code, and you're happy to distribute it and uh, and so on. Um, and this is from the data set that you guys uh, that Ashlyn sent out maybe earlier this week or last week, uh, the finger tapping data. So I have um, I have this folder um, which contains this uh, this finger tapping data. Um, so so right now I have a folder. It's called Nerex Webinar, and inside there's a folder called Finger Tap. And inside of finger tap, um, I was given two data files, one in which they were tapping their fingers while seated, and the other one, they, I guess, were moving around and there's more motion artifacts in it. If we look in either of these, um, these, these files, we have, our, we have our subject and then there's our actual uh, NERAX data. So, so we've created this hierarchy of Here's my here's my study. My study has two components: a um, finger tapping still and a finger tapping with artifacts. And within those folders is all the data associated with that 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 task. And so so what we can do is we can use in the toolbox we can use the load directory function. We point to the finger tapping folder, and we tell it the second argument tells us how to interpret this hierarchy. So it says that any files you find in the folder called finger tap still, they're going to be a uh, artifact type still. And any files you find in this other folder, they're going to be the other artifact type. So what we see is we ended up loading up two data files uh, from that. And if we use the command nears.create demographics table, what we can see is that it loads um the subject id age gender experiment remarks that was all information that came from the nerex file itself so that was when they you collected your data on the nerex system you entered in demographics and so on uh when you registered the subject and that all stays in the file and gets loaded um in this demographics and then we created this last column uh which i i just titled artifact which basically tells me which folder it came from um, so if we had multiple, we had more than two files, um, uh, this would be a bookkeeping of which files were associated with which type of, of task, okay? So, so if we look at this, let's look at just the first file. So if we say raw.draw, what it's gonna do is it's gonna draw uh, both of these files. And so we see the first one here where they were finger tapping, uh, while seated um, versus the second one. The second one has a little bit of motion artifacts. Um, you have some files here that have a little bit of a shift. You have a couple spikes uh, in the data. This, these are outliers. They're clearly, you know, order an order of magnitude about uh, difference in terms of the jump at that time point uh, versus the rest of, of, of the, the, the data there. Um, so what we need to do then in for my, the nearest analysis is we need to um, uh, fix the timing information. So right now with the NERAC system, it recorded the start of each of these events, the red and the blue lines at the bottom. Um, but what this task actually was, was a 10 second finger tapping. And uh, it alternated between left hand and right hand tapping. And so what we need to do is we need to, we have functionalities here, uh, so we're going to call the function called nears.design.change stimulus duration. And what we're going to do is we're going to use that to change the stimulus duration to 10 seconds um, instead of the, the spikes. So now if I draw it, um, now we get these 10 second boxcars uh, with the events. Okay. We're also going to then run this uh, code that's called rename stims because we need to rename these events I don't really like channel one and channel two I want to call them left and right because that makes more sense to me so if we run this now um, so we, we we created a job uh, with this module called rename stims 
that job had a couple of, um, or had a field that we need to modify called the list of changes. And we tell it what the stim was before. It used to be called channel one. Now we're gonna call it left. Uh, it used to be called channel two. Now we're gonna call it right. And then we run that job on the raw data, capturing the result back. And I, I, just, I just called it raw uh, to, to come back. So if we now draw the data, now I'm just showing one of them here, now it's gone from being channel one and channel two to being left and right, and we get this, this, uh, this, time, um, this time course here, okay? So this is all just kind of pre getting the data ready to do analysis within my toolbox. Um, I'll take the time here to show a couple other options too. So things that I've added recently, there's a function called GUI, so if you say raw.gui, what it does, it actually gives a, a kind of a graphical interface here that you can click around and change, um, uh, let's say all off. So, so you can go and you can, you, can, you can add, you know, so you can view just some of the data. Um, so kind of like the Homer interface used to be where you can actually click around and see things you can change which wavelengths uh, you are looking at there. Um, there's also, um, if we say nearest dot viz uh, for visual, visualization, there's a function called stim utility. And if we run that, what that allows us to do is we can go and if we wanted to change the duration, let's say that that one was 15 seconds, we can go and manually enter that timing. Uh, what I did from the command line version was I just set them all to 10 seconds, uh, but we could actually go in and we could edit things um, visually manually uh, with this, this little GUI and we can switch between the two, the two files like that. Um, we can also do tricks in this GUI. If you right click, you can do things like, um, you can set all the durations to, you can set all the amplitudes, uh, you can shift the events. So if we wanted to shift everything by 10 seconds or whatever, um, maybe the timing came from E prime, so it was set as a, as a known thing, but E prime started you know, 30 seconds in uh, after the nears actually started recording. So we need to shift all of our time points or all of our events uh, from the, maybe the Excel file that E-Prime generated um, and shift them. Uh, we can do that here by entering a time. I'm not gonna do that because obviously this, this data um, um, was collected properly there. Um, the events here, all the events, they have a name and onset, which is when they started, a duration, which is how long they were, and then this field called amplitude. And what amplitude is, is um, it's a way to run parametric general linear models. So right now all the amplitudes are one, which means that all the trials are gonna give, be given the same weight. But say I had, I wanted to look at habituation effects, right? What I might do is I might, um, how many are there, six here? I might change this such that we have, um, Oops, there were not six. I totally can't count, but that's okay. Something like something like that, um, where the amplitude is changing. Um, it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, let's see if I can. Sixty, fifty. I just I'm just playing around with it so we can actually see it a little bit better. Um, but if you change the amplitude of the events. And now when I run the, just remove, delete. Oops. Okay, but if, if you change the events, now what you're running is you're running a model where you're looking at, uh, did the brain activity also change on that same uh, per amplitude? So in other words, if um, you had a, a learning effect, the first time you did it, you had a bigger change than the next time you did it, and then the the you know brain activity got less still and less still. You would get brain activity that was decreasing with the number of repetitions. And so, if you put in the amplitude to model that, 
what you would find is when that that the coefficient associated with that one term that that term that's changing with repetition would tell you whether or not your brain activity was um, was also changing. So if we saw it as a if we put an amplitude decreasing like that and we had beta positive, it would mean that the brain activity was indeed going down with repeated trials. So we might have brain activity that was some brain activity that was constant and some brain activity, some regions that were decreasing because motor learning or something like that. And so you can generate these kind of parametric models uh, by using um, using that amplitude field like this. And of course, I did something, oh, because it's asking me to confirm and I'm gonna say no. Um, and then I'm gonna close it. Okay, sorry. I mean, just to make sure I didn't mess up anything. Okay. So, 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 um, so that's just prepping the data, right? So we now have these two files that have been um, the late the 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 timing has been labeled and 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 so on. This data, um, if we look at raw dot the probe. If we look at the probe, we can go and we can, if we change this default draw function, when what the default draw function does is it controls what the how the probe is drawn. So before it was drawn as a 2D plot, I changed the default draw function to 1020 so that now when I draw it, um, or if I say raw one dot GUI, now what it's going to do is it's going to draw it based. Uh, it's going to draw to 1020 space. And if you say raw, uh, if you give it a question mark, it'll actually tell you what options there were. So you can draw it in 2D space. Um, the, this this option here. You can draw it in 1020 space. Um, if you add the keyword zoom, it'll actually only show. Um, so I'll just do that really quick. Uh, zoom. So now when I say raw dot raw one dot probe dot draw, now what it's no actually it it didn't do it. It's supposed to zoom in on just the region of interest, just where you had the probe. Um, yeah, I spelled something wrong. That's all right. Uh, and then you can do it in 3D. So we can say 3D. I want to show the mesh. I want to show the brain underneath, and I want to show it from uh, the the superior direction. So now, when you draw it, it'll look like this, where you actually have the 3D head um, that you can rotate around and and so on, and actually view exactly where the probe was based on your NARAX registration. Um, one thing you can do is if you don't like um, those fiducial marks on there, you can say probe dot, um, oops, what is, um, set fiducial visibility. And if you set that to false, now when you draw it, now it's going to turn off those, those, uh, those labels. So you're, you're, um, it no longer has all those 10, 20 points. You can see the brain a little bit better um, underneath. So this probe, you can kind of see here, it actually has short distances in it. So um, there is a number of these long three centimeter distances. There's also uh, this short, um, I think it's a seven millimeter uh, uh, separation in there. So in the, the toolbox, what we can do is um, if we label which channels are short separations, we can actually use this within our GLM model. And so we can run this module called label short separations. And what that did is if I look at the probe uh, link variable, so this tells me of those 108 channels, which one was source one, detector two at wavelength 760, et cetera. Um, but this last column here, um, is whether or not that channel was a short separation. So we see that 
uh, source one detector 16 was actually a short separation uh, channel of data. And so now what we can do is now that we've marked up our stimulus events, we've labeled what is a short separation, we can actually run our, uh, our models. So we're gonna create a pipeline here. This first, the pipeline first computes optical density, then it resamples. It's gonna resample to one Hertz. That's just gonna make it faster uh, for this demo. Generally, I like to run things at four Hertz, um, but it runs like N squared. So this is gonna run 16 times faster. Um, we're then gonna run the Beer-Lambert law. I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna come back to it because um, uh, I just wanna show the basic stuff first. Uh, so then we're going to run the GLM. We're going to use the defaults, which is this. Uh, shall I just just run this? We're going to use the defaults, which is this auto regressive uh, IRLS, the the algorithm I talked about. And then now within the GLM model, we have this flag called add short separation regressors, which if I set that to true, I say job dot add short separation regressors, oops, not tree, true. Uh, what it's gonna do now is, in addition to that evoked response, the, the, the stimulus, it's gonna add the short separation data as nuisance regressors within the model. So it's gonna actually, to, to solve the GLM, using those as additional uh, regressors. So if I run this, um, to do first file, second file. So now I've got this uh, field called subject stats. I have two of them, one for the first file, one for the second. And so what, what I can do is I can uh, draw a T test. Let's auto scale it and let's say, um, Q less than 0 0.05, oops. Oh, and it's not t-test, it's t-stat. And it's opening up on this window, so let me get rid of the deoxy for a second. So here's the Oxyhemoglobin uh, image to, this is right tapping, so you see left-sided activity. Uh, left tapping, you see right-sided activity uh, with this. And you, know, you can rotate this around. This is, uh, this is the first data file, the one that didn't have as much uh, as uh, the motion artifacts. If we draw out the second file, oops, hold on, let me, um, probe dot default draw function because I want it to look the same. It's opening up on my other window. That's why you don't quite see it. So so actually, let me um, let me do something to make it look more fair uh, so that it's not confusing. And let's scale it to um, negative six to six so that they're both on the same scale. Did I line those up right? Okay. So um, what we end up seeing, right? So the, this is the this row is the one that was cleaner data. Uh, this row is the one that had a little bit noisier data. Um, so drawing them on the same scale, we see that you know the effect size is considerably lower. So here you're going up at a t-score of about six to the uh, what is kind of the motor region. Uh, down here you're seeing it at maybe three. Uh, so because the noise, the, the data has more noise to it, 
your effect size is going to be smaller. Um, so even though we're running the algorithm that is not going to um, have false positives due to motion artifacts, um, we still take a hit because the data is noisier that our effect sizes go down. Uh, so what you end up seeing is with the motion artifacts, uh, the effect sizes took a hit. It's going to take me more subjects to average to, to bring those effect sizes up. Um, but generally, you kind of get the same result of, you know, you get right-sided activity, uh, left-sided activity when you, you tap your, your right hand. Um, and I'm running out of time. Wow. Okay. I talk way too much. Um, what I will show, too, is we can do um, with this data, we actually have um, some accelerometers that were recorded. And so what you can do, that gets stored in this field called auxiliary. And so we can actually look at if we we extract the uh, this, this auxiliary data, uh, we can actually draw it. And we see that you've got an accelerometer uh, on this. Uh, so when they were tapping their fingers, there's a there's an effect. Um, uh, they're moving more. Their head is moving more. And what we can do is we can run this code here that's called add auxiliary regressors. And what this does is this is going to move those um, uh, the, that channels, those accelerometers from this external recording and actually put them in as regressors within the GLM. It's going to put them in as regressors of no interest. And so now if we run this again, um, job.add true. Now when if we run it again, now what it's doing is it's running this GLM model. There's the evoked response, the time, the stimulus timing. There's still the short separation data that's being partialed out. And now there's accelerometer data that's that's being partialed out as, as well. Uh, and so we'll, we can see if it has an effect on uh, the results. I think I erased my, oops. So this is now, this is that first data that doesn't have the, the motion artifacts in it. We basically get the same result. Um, um, but uh, what we can do is we can actually try to quantify that, right? So that was just one subject. Well, let's do that ROC uh, ROC analysis. We can generate thousands of data sets from this one by adding um, kind of uh, fictitious uh, brain activity. And we can actually start to compare uh, the different models. And so, so what I did uh, earlier today was I actually created five different pipelines. So this one that's running ordinarily squares, this one that's running the AR model, the AR model with short separations, the AR model with um, the accelerometers only, and then the AR model with both accelerometers and uh, short separation. Um, so I can go and I can I can generate these five pipelines. I can create this ROC uh, object, which I assign it. I want to compare these five pipelines. Um, in the simulate function, what I'm doing is I'm actually taking that same data, that actual experimental data, and I'm erasing the stimulus. I'm adding uh, randomly some 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 known stimulus and known um, brain activity to a subset of the channels, and then I can run that through and do multi many many iterations of that. And so I can do that using the data file that has no motion artifacts and the data artifact, the one that had motion artifacts. So I already ran this because it took um, a bit of time. Um, let's actually skip this. This is the rock curve. So this is now, so what we're looking at here is, uh, which one's which? This is the one, figure one here is the one, the cleaner data. Figure two is the noisier data. The blue line here is ordinarily squares. These two lines are the models that are using um, the accelerometers. Uh, the, the, um, 
And these two are the ones that are using the short separation. So this one, one is short separation, um, sorry, ordinarily squares, AR model, AR model with accelerometers. So you see that adding the accelerometers to the AR model didn't really help at all. AR model with short separation, and then AR model with short separation and accelerometers. Um, and so we can actually start looking at, again, the closer you are to a left-hand corner, the better you are. So with this data set, the best thing to do was to put in the short separation uh, measurements uh, in the context of the AR uh, GLM model. Uh, and that gave these, these curves up in the, in the corner. It didn't matter if you added the accelerometers, it didn't actually help in this, in this, uh, this particular data set. Um, if you go to this one, figure two, this is the same data, uh, or this is the now that data set that has the motion artifacts. So you see overall, with the same level of added synthetic brain activity, the area of the curve is a little bit lower because you have more noise. Um, so everything kind of went down a little bit, uh, but it's still the case that the best thing to do was to actually put in the short separation regressors uh, into the GLM that that gave the best area into the curve. Um, and I want to see if there's anything else I wanted to show you guys, but um, I guess I will stop there. Um, and maybe since I've got like 30 seconds left, I'd like to answer, answer questions. Uh, Hello, Dr. Bert. Oh, we yeah. cannot, I think we cannot hear you, Ashley. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> you, okay, you can't so hear I, my what? No, no, Ashley. Ashley, oh, we cannot Ashley. hear her okay. still. I was yeah. like, I just talked for 45 minutes. You couldn't hear no, me? No, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, not you, Ashley. She's having some, some problems with her mic. No problem. Uh, so I will, ask, I will ask some questions and Milan can also help me. Uh, okay, so one of the questions that, that we have actually in the first, uh, from the first uh, webinar, it's, is it possible to run the ANCOVA analysis within the, within the toolbox? ANCOVA, I don't have ANCOVA. I have, an, I have mixed effects, I have ANOVA, I don't have an ANCOVA uh, module yet. Um, so that's not, that's, that's not there. Um, and actually, since since you you brought it up, we can look at this is uh, if we say nears dot modules dot tddr. So the the uh, so this is the tddr code that you asked about, and so let's just kind of look at see what this effect this has. Um, so there's there's two flags on here uh, that were actually added recently. The first flag is use PCA. And so by default, it's false, which means it's going to take, you know, four one to number of channels. It's going to analyze what's an outlier on each channel separately. Uh, so it uses time information, but it doesn't take advantage of any spatial structure. Um, I added this PCA of what it does. So if we, if we set that to true, what it's going to do is it's first going to do a PCA rotation. So now the first component ideally captured all that motion artifact. The last components didn't have any motion artifacts. It then does TDDR on the components, removes outliers from component one, maybe more aggressively because it has more artifacts than component two and, and so on, and then rotates everything back. Uh, so if it's, if it's, so kind of the recommendation is actually use PCA true Let's just look and see what this looks like. Let's say R2 is job.run. Let's only look at the second file because that's the one that had the motion artifacts. Um, R2.draw and R.draw. Oops. Oops, sorry. Oops, and I drew them on top of each other and that didn't help. Um, so actually, the TDDR didn't really do very much at all um, in this in this case. 
uh, you see a couple of the artifacts like down here uh, got removed a little bit um, in terms of the principal component version. Uh, let's see what happens when I run the regular version. Uh, use PCA is false. Let's call that raw three. And actually, it, whether or not I used, where's my other plot? Um, so original data on figure one with PCA, without PCA. It, I mean, it did a little bit in terms of it cleaned up some artifacts here, um, but it really didn't, the TDR didn't really um, do very much. And the reason for that is that these MOSH artifacts, one, they're not very global. Right, you see these only affecting a couple of the channels, uh, not really all the channels. Um, and two, it they're not really that big, right? Compared to say what we saw in Teresa Wilcox's data, where it just crazy went off the charts. These were really strong outliers. Um, remember, it's removing, it's downweighting. If you're a crazy strong outlier, you're going to go to zero. But if you're just a moderate outlier, maybe it gets 50% reweighted. Uh, so it's not going to actually zero them per se, um, but it did have a little it it, it did have a little bit of an effect. Um, okay, it had actually less effect than I. It was less dramatic than I. I had I known the results were not going to be that dramatic, I wouldn't have kind of gone through that. But <laughs> next oh. time we will record worse data. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. So it has Next, I mean, where we see most artifacts, right, is in this was a, a data that was collected on an adult. Where we see most artifacts is generally kid data because you can't put the probe on as tight, right? You put the probe on a kid tighter and they're not going to sit for as long into the study. Um, it's going to be more uncomfortable. They're going to be pulling at this, this thing. Um, which means the population that's more likely to move is the population that you can't put the cap on as tightly, which generates more motion artifacts. So it's kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, so you should have had whoever collected this data, like scratching their head or pulling on the cap or something to kind of simulate what happens with kids. Um, that's a good idea. We will we'll simulate this the, the next time. <laughs> that's good. Uh, so one one other cache that I have is actually on the accelerometer. So you yep. show one way to incorporate them. Uh, they're asking if there any other way you can incorporate the accelerometer for your data, so, and if having one more than acceler one two, for example, or, or more would so, be beneficial. So so, so um, this was the first time I I mean you guys gave me this data set. It was the first time I really used accelerometers, uh, at least from the the NIRAX data. So, so what we have found in the past is actually having multiple accelerometers is better than having just one. Because it, it, if you put an accelerometer on the head, I really don't actually care that the head moved, right? I mean, we've done studies of dancing, moving around, et cetera. You can move around all you want. It's the cap that's slipping relative to the head. So what we do, what you could do is if you have two accelerometers, either on two different parts of the cap or one on the head and one on the cap. What you look at now is the cross product between those two vectors. You're looking for, did the head move as a rigid body, right? In which case the relationship between these accelerometers stays constant or you know, the one on the head. I'm like dancing on webinar here. Um, or did the accelerometer shift? Did one move and the other one didn't? Which means that the cap moved, right? and the cat move relative to the head. So what we actually have found is if you have two accelerometers and instead of using the data as is, you actually compute the cross product between the two and look at the cross product as your regressor. That works a lot better for capturing the motion artifacts. Um, but that requires two acceler at least two accelerometers. And if you have it on two parts of the cap, you're looking for did the cap move, did the cap kind of one part of the cap move relative to the other. If you have one on the head and the other on the cap, now it's, it, you know, did the cap move relative to the to the subject? Um, um, so. Right. so you have more possibilities to try to quantify your movement also in this case. Yeah, 
But right okay. now, you know, so so I put them in as news as regressors of no interest within the GLM. Uh, you could potentially do it as a pre-processing step. Um, so if you just like the short separation, you could run a GLM with just that regressor, take the residual, and then feed that into the 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 stats looking for evoked response. Excuse me. Or you could do it all as one step. Uh, what we found from the, the paper about short separation was it was always better to do it as one step because your stats knew about what you were doing. Um, whereas if you do it as a pre-processing, it could potentially uh, remove too much. Um, uh, so we found that the type two error was increased when you did it as a two, as a two step process, um, but you could deal with the accelerometers in the same way. Um, <laughs> I guess another way you could do it is um, you could use the accelerometers um, and you could define outliers. You know, what are the, you know, statistical, out what are the time periods in which the motion occurred? You could then use that to maybe downweight the model uh, so that you're only okay. including clean data in your GLM. I don't have code to do that yet, but it's really easy to add. And that's one of the things that I've been uh, kind of working on. Um, okay. We're actually going to use um, uh, Luca Palomini's uh, 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 Phoebe stuff, where it looks at right. the, 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 you know, here's a time point in which you have a lot of artifact because it doesn't have the, the scalp coupling and so on, and then use that to, uh, uh, instead of just removing outliers, you're removing time points in which that criterion was not met. Um, and again, you remove it from the data and the design matrix. Um, just okay. like we do with the, the whitening. You could potentially do that with the accelerometers as well. However, if you look at these accelerometers, right, you moved every time you tapped your fingers. Uh, so you would be, by that criterion, you would be removing all of the task, uh, which yeah. would be a bad thing. Um, which again, kind of if you had two accelerometers, you might be able to differentiate between what is a rigid body motion, the whole head move, but the cap stayed affixed uh, versus the cap sliding on the head. Um, Very so. interesting. We, uh, on this uh, regressor of no interest, we have one, one question also. Uh, are the regressors of no interest just like the other regressors in the model or, they, or are they orthogonal, orthogonalized or, or is any um, other different treatment? Um, so we have, I, I actually added this literally this morning. Uh, so it's actually not in the, the toolbox, uh, not in the public version yet. But you have um, the, the, the stimulus information. There's two types of ways to specify stimulus. There's uh, events and there's vectors. So um, here's dot design dot stim events and stim vectors. So so a ve a vectors are you have a time course like the accelerometers, uh, for example. Events are you have discrete onset durations. To both of these, I actually added a flag for regressor of no interest. So if you have a stimulus that you've you've created uh, you know with this vector or whatever and you set that flag to true when it solves the glm what it's going to do is it's going to it's going to use that in the regressor but then it's going to throw it out of this uh so it's it's not in the final reported stats so when okay. we do like the you know draw q less than 0.05 which is the benjamini hotchberg corrected we're not going to penalize for having that additional regressor that we didn't care about um, so, so right now, when you do with regressors of non-interest, if if you put it in manually and you can put in anything you want, either a, an event uh, or a vector, if you set that flag, it's going to use it as is. For the short separation or my code that actually uses it, the accelerometers, it's actually doing a, a, a PCA to orthogonalize it. Um, so if you're using my code, kind of those modules that automatically kind of import it, it, it orthogonalizes it. Um, but if you didn't want to, you could manually import it and just use it as is, if that made sense. Yes, totally. Um, thank you. We have uh, two more questions. Or sorry, I mean, we won't be able to answer everything. But no, I, 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 I blocked off. Uh, quite a bit of time today, so I don't mind going over, but um, you guys might. Um, 
So yeah. So uh, there is another one. So talking actually about the amplitude. So should uh, one input the amplitude when working with cognitive data, where the duration might differ according to the according to the reaction of the yeah. of the participant? So this yeah. is so, something. So, we should so, do. so one advantage of um, um, so so in in the in the toolbox we have nearest dot design dot um, basis. Oops. Dot basis, and uh, we have the canonical basis sets. We also have um, uh, what are called the FIR, the impulse response ones, um, and the FIR ones are actually doing a deconvolution. And if um, if you do the FIR ones, there's this additional flag called is impulse response. And what that's going to do is that's going to take the stimulus duration, and if your if your task was 30 seconds, it's going to take that 30 second boxcar and convolve it uh, with this impulse response. Um, so it is allow in in a model like that, your tasks can all have different durations. If you're dealing with a okay. straight deconvolution or a block averaging, then all your tasks have to have the same duration. Right is you can't average a 30 second and a 4 second window together. Um, so one of the advantages of the canonical of the canonical model or the FIR model as an impulse response is it adjusts for the duration of the task, and so you don't you can have self-paced tasks that have different timing, and you're still able to estimate the evoked response. Now you're assuming linearity which means say if I tap my fingers for 10 seconds uh, versus 20 seconds, 20 seconds is 10 seconds, you know, is just twice as big. Uh, so it has that assumption that the longer the duration, the task just keeps building up, um, but is able to then model different durations to the tasks within the same, uh, to get one estimate of brain activity, even though you have different durations. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, yes. The, the other way, the other way to do it is um, there's nearest dot design dot. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Raw equals nearest dot design given. I have to edit the. I have to look at the peek at the code to figure out what's under the hood uh, for this and what the input arguments were. Um, so given. Uh, date, given data and a formula, um, so let's see, let's, let's, let's just play with the first channel here. Um, raw one, so my formula, I'm going to use a condition, condition times one plus time. Okay, so, so and let's, let's center the variable. So what we should see here, oh, and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Um, uh, I don't know why that didn't work. Why didn't that work? <laughs> what we should have seen. This is why you don't do things live. <laughs> uh, uh, what what you should have seen is you should have ended up with two regre four regressors, the left and the right tap that was constant with time, and another one that was decaying with uh, the experimental time. So you would end up with a you know a constant uh, an intercept and a slope, and when you solved your GLM, you would have gotten four beta you know uh, beta for what brain activity was constant with time and what brain activity was changing with um, with experimental time. So like an habituation effect. If you <laughs> use the amplitude, like you encode say reaction time or something like that in there, um, you could actually look mm -hmm. at, that would give you what brain activity, was the brain activity for trials where you were faster different than the brain activity for trials that were slower, you were slower. You know, so okay. say you did a 30 second block and within that block you had 30 events and you had an average reaction time for those 30 events and the blocks where you were faster than the blocks where you were slower, was there a difference in the brain activity? And in that case, what you would do is you would code up that amplitude variable uh, to be reaction time 
and you would then look at that in the model and okay it's kind of it's going to be like weighing the the, the response in this in this sense right oh yeah i know what i did there we go so so in this okay. case you have four regressors you have left and right tapping and then left and right tapping as modulated by time um, okay. in which case you know you see these ones are kind of changing uh, with the experimental time this is a Very case where my, my code was smarter than me the way that you do it is you would say like um, it, it I, I had it written as condition like that but it actually wanted you to type in <laughs> what it was uh, okay. so that that would have you know, given just the left hemisphere. If I put in the question mark, it does both. You can also do, um, uh, if you do amplitude like that, it'll it'll let you put in that whatever that amplitude uh, variable was. So time, uh, D, DUR for duration, and amplitude, AMP, are kind of keywords that you can use in this, this function. Uh, you can also put in like uh, quadratic terms. So you can say something like this. Oops. Um, maybe you can't. Uh, you, you, um, you should have been able to do something like that, in which case you can have quadratic linear terms and, or quadratic time terms and stuff. Um, okay. Is that, I'm um, going to try my hand again. Can you hear me now? OK. Yes. Yeah. OK, Ashin. So if you want to make the next now. question. Um, so we get the uh, this question a lot. People are interested in using block averaging within the nearest toolbox, and um, we see that we can see that being done by pulling in the Homer two block average function. Um, so there is a question about um, so, getting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I forgot that you you asked that question. So so unfortunately, mm -hmm. one of the things that Homer two does not do properly is statistics. So mm -hmm. uh, importing any of the statistics programs in Homer um, really don't work because it just doesn't, the way that it solves it, it doesn't give the outputs that I need to within my toolbox to keep track of stats. Um, so so the, the deconvolution stuff like that doesn't work. Uh, I, I think it'll run, but it doesn't like actually save the right uh, statistics variable. So I think like the HRF, or sorry, the uh, block averaging saves it as a time course, but doesn't actually have any stats associated with that time course because, unfortunately, Homer also didn't give me the stats from it. I, I, I think, but that's so. If you say job equals nears dot modules dot, um, I think it's called run Homer two, um, and then you can say job dot uh, function is I don't know Homer. I don't even know if I have Homer 2 installed on this computer. Um, I, apparently, I don't. Um, but you'd say job.function is you know, Homer 2 motion correct, or whatever it is, whatever that function from Homer is. It'll auto-populate all the inputs and outputs based on what that function required. And so it'll automatically figure out where our Homer 2 needs the probe it'll figure out, it'll grab the probe from my data structure and put it into the Homer data structure and vice versa. Um, I wish I had Homer 2 installed on here because then I could show how it actually worked. Um, but what you can do is you can then run, um, um, I'll think about the block averaging, how to put that in. Um, I don't have block averaging in my code. Um, I only have GLM methods, um, mm -hmm. but I, I can think about it. Um, but for anything else, the motion correction, the short separation correction, and so on, in Homer, you can basically create a, a step in the pipeline that just calls that function, and then you know you use my optical density, my Beer Lambert law, then the Homer's motion correction, and then my GLM as one pipeline, and it'll just run. It should run completely um, seamlessly through like that. Um, the reason I don't have block averaging is because um, all the, the kind of those idea of let's get the stats right and let's do the robust regression and let's correct for serial correlations, you can't do that in block averaging. And so it's, um, 
I could do block averaging. It's really simple to code, but your stats wouldn't be right. Um, and so that's why I haven't wanted to code it in there. Uh, okay. So. Thank you. Um, yep. So we'll just ask one more question because we are definitely pretty over time, um, but we appreciate your sitting with us. So I I've had got, nothing else um, to do. I, where, where was I going to go? Um, <laughs> walk around the neighborhood one more time. I, I... <laughs> so I'm just going to read this one word for word. Um, is there any approach implemented in the toolbox or that you would recommend to perform statistics on the actual HRF after deconvolution? For example, something similar to cluster-based permutation methods employed to compare ERPs and EEG analysis instead Ugh. of performing statistics on the beta values as it is usually done. No, but that's interesting. Um, so so when, we, when we run, um, one thing I can show nears.modules, there's this whole set of default modules, and one of them is the FIR model. So you, you, if um, these are kind of complete pipelines that that run, uh, so like the FIR one would um, do the deconvolution and and so on. What's going to get returned is going to be the betas and the full covariance matrix. So so the relate you know the interdependency of all the betas to each other. Um, that should be sufficient to do clustering analysis in terms of you wrote your own code. I think that's the inputs that you would need is the beta and the full covariance matrix. But I don't have any code that does it. But you should have you should be, should be able to kind of um, write a wrapper around that or even write a module that that does it uh, within the toolbox. But I haven't I haven't given thought to how to actually do that. Um, if I do a block averaging, it would probably be one of these modules like like this. I've just created mm -hmm. a default module that's going to do block averaging, in which case what it's going to do behind the scenes is it's going to calculate an, a, the FIR model, uh, but then use the stats to pull it back as a... Because um, what you can do is... Um, the FIR models take a while, but I can do... Um, if If you have something that's already solved, you can call the function called href, and what it does is it'll actually um, pull it back as a time course. So in this case, it's just the canonical model, so it has it has a fixed structure. But when you run the uh, deconvolution, you run the FIR model, get the stats. It has all these betas. You can then say, you know, stats at href. And it should draw to something that looks like, excuse me, it looks like this that actually has all the um, the time course on it. Um, it's if you look at the variable, it's um, I did this trick of uh, treating it as a complex number where the real component is the shape that you see here, and the error bars are actually the imaginary component. Uh, so it was just kind of a trick to bookkeep how does a time course have error bars on it. Um, so if you do the deconvolute, the, you do the FIR model, um, there's a way to actually draw it as a curve with error bars. Um, and maybe I, I'll just generate a, a sample demo script on how to actually do that. Um, that's as close, I, I know I switched back to the, the, the block averaging question. Um, that's the closest I can have, I can do the block averaging and I just write code, a module that will estimate that curve and then put error bars on it. Uh, but it's done based on a deconvolution, not based on a block averaging. Um, and again, kind of to the second question, if I gave you that, if you had access to that information, which is just a case of showing you where it is, you could potentially write clustering and kind of more advanced code uh, on that. And I'm happy to put any of that in the toolbox if you, if whoever wrote the question implements that and wants to share, uh, I'm happy to kind of put some of those methods into the toolbox, so. That's great. Uh, so I guess um, that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hooper. Thank you very much for everyone that has been with us. Uh, you know, this is the third day. So uh, thank you very much that everyone that's been with us for more than six hours now, all combined, <laughs> so for our you know, brief analysis course with uh, two very well-known researchers. So um, we will 
uh, give all the this code already. Dr. Gupta already said that the code will be available. We will uh, make all the data set available also and uh, the webinar. And if you want more information from us, you can also email us and follow us on our social medias. New webinars will be coming up. So we'll wait for you guys. Thank you very much and see you next time. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you again, Dr. Rupert. Bye-bye.